The question for today is how many people speak English and why so many people speak English? Uh, the first answer sort of depends. As a ballpark figure, I'm fairly happy with the idea that there's about 500 million people who speak English pretty well, enough to communicate comfortably in it. And there's another 500 million who use it to get by as their L2 or L3, L4 in some cases. Um, that says that English is being used by about a billion people in one way or another. But, I mean, the number is not really meaningful because it depends so much on what you, you mean by to speak a language. To what degree, at what level of competence does one speak a language? And, and this is what's important in, in English. Now, uh, let's compare it with the other major languages, uh, Chinese is spoken, we're told, by 1.2 billion people, which is more. But if you get into it, there's lots of different Chinese languages being spoken, and they are mutually comprehensible through the writing system. So I can ask to what degree it is one language that's being used by 1.2 billion people. Spanish has, according to a, a number I just found, 437 million which is considerable, that's more people speaking Spanish than certainly the population of the United States or the United Kingdom. Uh, but these comparisons are not what's interesting. What's important is that English has this extensive use as an L2, L3, L4. And that is, it's being used by people who are L1 speakers of other languages. And this can mean it's being used as a lingua franca, in many, many circumstances. And it's likely to increase. Why? Well, in the People's Republic of China, everybody who goes to primary school by policy now has to learn English. So the future of English numerically may well depend on what the Chinese decide to do with it. Numerically, that is. It's importance as a lingua franca, as an L2, L3, L4, is going to increase and that's why we should be very interested in the reasons why it got to that position of dominance. It means, <laughs> is it owned by the people who impose it on the rest of the world? You know, this, this imperialist image, we have our language, we have conquered you, you will speak our language. And that's how it got to where it is. In part, that is the case. Uh, but the future of English cannot be conceptualized in those terms. And that's what I want to look at in some detail. Firstly, uh, wrong reasons why English has become dominant. Uh, it's so good. No, it is not a logical language. Its spelling is just, just a complete mess. If you wanted a logical language to impose on the world, you would first have to reform it. And its grammar with all these phrasal verbs and things is, no, 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 it's, it's not a nice language. It, 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 it's certainly not dominant because of any inherent qualities within it, uh, in terms of learnability, uh, for example, or even clarity, I suspect. Second reason, then, uh, is, as I mentioned, basic imperialism. There was this thing called the British Empire, on which the sun never set. That is, the empire that, it, that, that, that uh, went right around uh, the globe. And there was this dominance through sea power, and that means economic dominance, that did instill the global growth of capitalism, so there is an economic system that goes along with this. Uh, uh, what's remarkable is that after the end of that empire, many of the countries that were within that fray, uh, the post-colonial countries, have kept English as a language, as a national 
and often official language, uh, despite the end of empire. So what's interesting is that there was a moment of empire, there is a post-empire now, but the language still continues. Why would that be so? If the empire was so bad, and it was in many respects, why would these dominated, repressed peoples want to keep English? Uh, there are many logics according to particular situations, but the one that, that has to be remarked here is the fact that in many cases for nation building, it was useful to have a neutral language. Uh, in the case of India, where you have many regional languages, there are two official languages for the whole of the country. They are Hindi and English. Why should they keep English if they have Hindi? Well, the logic is that Hindi is closer to the L1 of part of the population, and so can be seen as being unfair, whereas English is foreign to the whole population, well, in theory, and uh, therefore has the virtue of neutrality or being equally despised by everybody. Uh, you could say something similar for uh, the role of Swahili and English in East Africa, or you could look at Singapore, for example, where you have uh, four official languages. Uh, English is not an L1 of any particular major electoral group in Singapore, but it's uh, an official language nevertheless because it's the same for everyone. Also, it's the language of trade in Singapore depends on international trade. So there are peculiar reasons for the maintenance of English that don't have to do with hegemony in its pure sense. You could also look at the argument about empire and say, well, why didn't the same thing happen for the other imperial hegemonic languages? Uh, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, French. Now, in some cases, they did, uh, but uh, Portuguese and Spanish never extended uh, beyond the colonies in the way that English has done. Uh, there are other cases, though, of a, a relatively powerless um, social base uh, producing a powerful language. One of the examples is Greek. Uh, after the end of the uh, of Greek dominance, you have the Roman Empire and the prestige of Greek uh, rose and, and, and Greek was spread out uh, and used as, as, as a lingua franca uh, to the extent that our New Testament of the Christian Bible is in fundamentally uh, Greek, even though they were not Greek speakers or L1 Greek speakers, and there was no Greek imperialism at that stage. Uh, another example might be the prestige of French uh, in the, from the second half of the 19th century. Uh, when uh, France was fundamentally defeated. It was defeated by Prussia in, in 1870, and the defeated power shouldn't have any prestige on the international stage, but the French language continued as a language of culture uh, throughout Europe and beyond. So what we see happening with English uh, does find its counterparts elsewhere in history. Another argument is that it, it doesn't matter what the British did with their empire. Uh, from the end of the Second World War, we live in a Pax Americana. The United States dominates the world economy and um, it is the hegemonic power in international relations. Well, it has been since the age of Ronald Reagan or the, the breaking up of the Soviet Union. And that that is the hegemony that imposes English upon us all. Okay, fair enough. Everybody in the world can learn English by watching online videos of Friends and Big Bang Theory and things like that. And they are going to get American English. Good. But it's not American English that everybody is speaking in the world. And this is the problem. If this theory were true, all young people would always be speaking American English all over the world. And, and some are, I must admit. But go and speak to people in Nigeria, 
in South Africa, in India, in Singapore, in Australia, in Hong Kong, anywhere you like, and you'll find that they are adopting American words because they do, that's where it comes through the culture, but with very, very strong regional Englishes. They all have their own regional accents and the accents are getting stronger. That is, the development of diversity in English is countering that top-down argument that uh, economic dominance on the United States is imposing one language on the world. It's not happening if you look at the use of variation in the language, and that's why it's really, really interesting to just focus on variation and see which way things tend to be changing. So why did English become dominant? Well, any of those reasons would be part of the answer. I think there's not just one answer for a phenomenon like this. I will, however, just add one final one. Um, there's no doubt that uh, communications, that is economic globalization, but also the globalization of communication systems, uh, increases steadily from the 1950s. And as it increases, as globalization increases, uh, there is a need for one language just for the pure economics of reducing transaction costs, make communication more efficient and more readily available for those particular kinds of communications, not for all the others, because people still speak many, many other languages. Now, as that happened, as there is a need for a common language for particular kinds of communications, any language that has a slight advantage at that stage, that is even slightly ahead, is going to be picked up and used as the one language. And the slight difference is going to become a big difference very, very fast. Not because it's so good, not because of the factors that put that slight difference in place, but because of the systemic need of globalized communications. So, my thinking is that, that there were a number of reasons that gave English a slight edge in the 50s and 60s. And then because it had that just slight edge, just a slight advantage, the communication systems themselves picked it up and have made it a global phenomenon. That may be why English is spoken by so many people and by so many people in a L2, L3, L4 capacity. Uh, but you're welcome to come up with other reasons and to put them to the test.